Welcome everybody and thank you for joining our global webinar day on five things that keep NCCM network engineers awake at night, how to solve them with Infosim StableNet and enjoy your life. We will start in about one or two minutes uh, just giving everybody a chance to log in and uh, join our session in time. So we'll be right back, just uh, stay with us for one or two more minutes. Welcome again everybody and again thank you for joining our global webinar day on five things that keep NCCM network engineers awake at night, how to solve them with InfoSim StableNet and enjoy your life. My name is Dietmar Kneidel, I'm with InfoSim and I will be your moderator for today's event. Our presenter is John Olson, VP Technical Services Americas at InfoSim and he will guide you through our today's webinar. Before I hand over to John, just wanted today's audience to know that all of you are automatically muted just to keep down the background noise. So in order for us to answer your questions or to actually see and receive your questions, you will have to type them in the uh, questions slash chat window at the bottom of the GoToMeeting application. John will be answering all questions right after the presentation in our Q&A session. Also, please note that this event is being recorded and all registrants will be notified via email tomorrow on how to access the recording. Well, guess we're ready now. Uh, everybody is here, crowd has shuffled in. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and turn things over to our presenter, John Olson. John, are you there? I am Dietmar, thank you very much. And thank you everyone for attending the session today. Uh, as Dimar mentioned, uh, I'm the head of technical services here in North America, and uh, the broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. This is John Olson, uh, head of technical services here in North America. Uh, I welcome you to today's global web. Uh, and uh, I'll be taking you through a presentation, sort of a combination presentation and uh, uh, demonstration of the product. So I'll be moving back and forth between the slides and a, and a live demo of the product. Uh, the, uh, the presentation today is on uh, five things that keep NCCM engineers awake at night and how to solve them with StableNet. So we're going to be taking you through kind of using that as our guide to take you through some of the features uh, of the product and really uh, show off what it can do. Uh, for, just before we get started in a sort of the meat of the presentation, uh, I just want to, for those of you who are not familiar with InfoSim, give you a little background on the, the company. Uh, we uh, have been around for over 10 years, so founded in 2003. A privately owned company headquartered in Germany but with offices globally. Of course, I uh, work out of the uh, America's office. We also have offices in Singapore and in the UK. And uh, our customers are really primarily comprised of uh, telcos, carriers, and uh, large enterprises. That's really our space, is sort of the, the large uh, or very large enterprise space and, and telco. Uh, we actually have two versions of our product. One is called enterprise and one is called telco, so that tells you exactly uh, the, the markets that we're in. And then within uh, those markets, we have a single product, StableNet, that is um, capable of performing across various functions of, of network management. So we call it network performance service assurance uh, and that is really comprised of a few different solutions all bundled into one product. Uh, what we call configuration management, 
which is what we're going to be focusing on today, performance management and fault management, which we have had and will have other webinars dedicated to. But today, we're talking specifically about configuration management, configuration and change management, uh, as we term it, uh, uh, what we do in the product. Overall, uh, and this is the last of the sort of the, the the pre-slides and the marketing slides, we are uh, a unified code base. This is one of our major strengths uh, of our solution. We have never been acquired by anyone. We've never acquired any technology. Everything in the product has been built from the ground up by the same team of developers, essentially, from the beginning. Uh, so what that means is you really do have a unified product. It's not uh, an integrated solution made up of, you know, uh, mergers and acquisitions and other, other technology. Uh, you have a single view, a single database, all of the parts of the product talk to each other. That will actually become important as I go through some of the things uh, that we're talking about today and I'll, I'll make mention of that as we go through. Um, and, this, and because of that, we're also extremely scalable. We're one of the world's most scalable products. If you are a very large telecom or a very large global organization, we are one of the few products that can actually handle your size and scale. And that's just been our MO from the beginning. That was the original design of the product was to hit that market and is, uh, we've done nothing but continue to build on that scalability as the product has been developed. Uh, the second thing we really focus on is automation. So with a little little bit of uh, work ahead of time, you can automate and should be automating most of the uh, uh, tasks that an, uh, a management system, whether it's on the performance or fault side or on the NCCM side, is doing. Uh, and we'll talk about how we uh, engage in that automation as we go forward in the presentation today. So between all of that, we, we uh, try to deliver massive benefit to our customers and an ROI that's measured in months, not years. So uh, as we go through this, what's issue number one? For me, it's always been, uh, and this is where we really begin as a product, what do I have on my network? Do I know what I have on my network, especially if we're talking about large-scale networks, which, again, is who we are mostly selling to. Uh, and those, there's, a, there's usually a very rapid pace of change within those. There's new devices being provisioned all the time, older devices being shuffled around or taken off the network, modules and, and uh, daughter cards and things that are constantly being changed uh, to meet requirements. The idea is how do I keep up with all of that? Um, and really, the answer answer to that is the only way to do that is, is to use an automated uh, uh, software product to do that discovery, that asset inventory for you. If you try to do this by hand, keep it in spreadsheets, it's just never going to be, it's never going to be correct, first of all, you'll never be able to keep up with it. Um, and uh, it's really important to, to have that information. It's important to know what you have. Uh, if you're going to try to automate things later and say, hey, go change this configuration on all of my devices running a particular software version, well, you need to know what devices are running that software version, right? Or what uh, devices have uh, certain modules in them which may make them capable of running a particular service or not. Um, if you don't have that good information up front, you can't then automate other tasks behind the scenes. You won't be able to keep up with things like uh, maintenance contracts that are based around serial numbers and things. You won't be able to keep up with life cycle of devices. So it's incredibly important to be able to start with a, an automated discovery process that records that key hardware and software information, including part numbers, serial numbers, and all of those other things. And of course, StableNet offers that. It's really the, the heart of a lot of what we do. Uh, onboarding devices through our own discovery is, is incredibly uh, important to how we run everything. Uh, I'm actually going to take you into the product for our first sort of show and tell here. Into I'll move over into the inventory area. This is where we uh, will sh display the results of the discovery. Um, and uh, in one of the places that will display the results. Our discovery is incredibly powerful. It's incredibly flexible, flexible and it's incredibly fast for those large, uh, large networks. Uh, at the end of the day, what you have is a, a, uh, a tree-based uh, hierarchical grouping of your devices. Uh, those groupings can be created any way that you wish, so it could be based on IP address, it could be based on a syslocation or a name or some combination of all three that, to automatically drop devices into the appropriate groups. 
And then when you have those devices, you have lots of information about them. If I just pick on a single device here and dive into the global information, you'll see the kind of information that we gather. Now, we have a lot of ways of, of kicking off this discovery. It can be done uh, via uh, a range of IP addresses, uh, more commonly, especially in larger networks. We are given the IP addresses of devices that we need to onboard into the system. Many times we're given that by some third party CMDB or other asset based system. Uh, in many cases, they might tell us what we need to discover. We discover it and then we push that information back to them and they store that CI information in their database as well as our database. So we're very commonly integrating with things like CMDBs to, to keep each uh, system updated. But what you do have is a, a, is a deep, di deep dive, detailed information about the device, the system. In this case, it's a Cisco chassis. Um, it's got uh, the uh, OS details, the family and, and feature and version that we're running. Um, I'm pulling information in this case about CDP neighbors, about QoS uh, classes that have been uh, set up, uh, uh, about routing protocols and, and the OSPF neighbors and areas that are, uh, exist within the system. And then detailed module, uh, what we call module information. And this is sort of the, the subcomponents of the chassis, the daughter cards, the WICs, or other, what other uh, subcomponents are, exist. And they have their own serial numbers many times and their own firmware uh, revisions sometimes. And we gather all of that information and make it available to you as well. Um, beyond that, we can go into individual interfaces and look at their information. We can see connectivity amongst devices. So what is the connected device name, interface, IP, MAC address, uh, VLANs, and, and how are they connected uh, on each interface? Um, I can go down into those physical addresses and, and get more detailed information, uh, MAC addresses and things. Uh, and this really, again, provides the basis for not only an understanding of what you've got internal to how you view it in StableNet, but also many times the basis of things like maintenance contracts, lifecycle uh, views, uh, the automation that we're going to be talking about for configurations and provisioning later all comes from this uh, detailed device information, which is launched from our own discovery. It's a very powerful uh, engine within our product, and uh, it allows, and you can handle many, many, many thousands, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of devices with one stable net system, uh, the, way, uh, the way we've designed the, the application to work. So, uh, uh, Hopefully that makes sense on the on the asset inventory side. The second issue that we commonly hear people talk about and ask questions about is how do I know when something has changed, when there's been a change to a device on a network? Change happens all the time, especially in big organizations, and many times there are lots of people who can make changes. There are a lot of technicians who have the authority and the access to log into a, a system via CLI or web console and make some sort of change, an adjustment to a device, or whether it's a physical change or bringing up a new service or changing an, an interface, IP address, or, or anything. Uh, there are a lot of people who potentially might be able to do that. Um, and what's important is from a monitoring perspective or from a management uh, view is that you need to be able to track those changes. You don't necessarily want to prevent people from making those changes. You don't necessarily want to force them to make those changes through your product or in, our, in this case our product like StableNet, although they can. Um, but a lot, we all know that a lot of people, they just log in. They log in, they make a change, they save it, they log out. It happens all the time. What's important is that you can track those changes. Uh, StableNet offers that as a capability. Most of the time we get that information from a message, if you will, that comes from the device. It's a syslog. Uh, it's a trap. It's some other message that sends information to us that a change was made and uh, usually includes information about who made that change and, and in some cases what that change was. Um, we can obviously track all of that. We can provide uh, audit reports so you can see what happened yesterday, what changes were made, what's happened in the last week. Um, but also, and this is just as critical, is we can use that change information to trigger an action. Uh, typically, those actions are things like re-back up the device uh, because that change may have changed the config and I don't want to have to wait for the end of the day when I run my full uh, backups uh, to, to 
to catch that. I want to run it now because I saw that a change was made. Or uh, trigger a new discovery, which is also very common. Again, most of our customers may run a, a rediscovery job, if you will, once a night. Or sometimes more often than that, sometimes less often than, than that, depending on their situation. But they don't want to have to wait until that automated procedure is kicked off um, if there's been a change made during the day. They may say, okay, I see that change. I want to trigger a rediscovery and another backup, like I said earlier, so that I always have up-to-date uh, as much as possible information about that, dis that device in my uh, StableNet instance. So uh, we, we offer that, uh, those triggers. Uh, we're watching, we're, we're collecting that data, we can make the reports available, and then we can do things when we see that, and that, uh, that change being made. Issue number three that we uh, very, very commonly run up against is uh, the idea, do I have accurate backups of my critical device configurations? It seems obvious uh, that you should have uh, backups. Uh, people have been backing up servers, and they've been backing up databases and files for years and years and years. That's probably one of the most common practices in, in uh, IT. But not everybody backs up their device configurations. And many times, I, and I see this all the time, is they do it via the old uh, cut and paste in the notepad method. Uh, I make a configuration change when I'm done. I copy it. Uh, I drop it into notepad. I put it up on a server someplace, and that's my backup. But, um, Although that may technically be a backup, that is not in reality a backup solution. Uh, number one, because it's, it's fraught with peril, it's fraught with uh, forgetfulness. People just don't do it. They make a change, they forget. Maybe they need to make 100 changes on 100 devices, and they, they you know, don't always remember to, to back up every one. Uh, the best case scenario, of course, is to use a tool to do those backups for you. You know it's going to be done. It's going to be done on a schedule. It's going to be done consistently. It's going to be done across many platforms. Uh, and StableNet is platform independent. So uh, although you see a Cisco backup in the, uh, in the chart uh, here or in the graphic, that does not mean that's all we support. We support many vendors, and we agree. We always uh, guarantee that we will add new support for our customers uh, if they've got vendors that we don't currently support. And so, therefore, now you've got, when you schedule these things, you've got a real backup. It happens very quickly. It's automated. It happens the same way every time. It will tell you if there's a failure, so you can uh, try and identify why the failure may have occurred. Maybe it's a bad username and password, or the device uh, is not providing access for some reason and you can go solve that issue at that time. Uh, those device backups can be stored in our database, always are stored in our database, but can also be offloaded into other third-party systems, uh, whether that's another uh, backup uh, system in your network or even in a cloud system via SCP or FTP or something like that, you can do it. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the things that, that really can prevent you from uh, uh, having a sleepless night is knowing, okay, everything's backed up. If there's a problem, I know where I can get to the right config for that device. I know that I can restore it. I can see what changes have been made. As you'll see when I get into the product, you can uh, compare backups. You can look at things. Um, and it's not, just, it's not just pure config backups, like running configs or, or um, it actually includes, in our case, what we call snapshot troubleshooting information. So these are things like a, uh, a show command, essentially, for a device or whatever the terminology is for that vendor. But it's anything that is that we can access via the CLI that will provide back to us some human-readable ASCII text. Um, or in other cases, some cases, it's not actually human-readable. We can store it. We obviously don't show it if it's like a binary backup, for example. But we can store it, and it is there, and it can be used sometimes for restor uh, restoration. Uh, in either case, whether you're doing just a pure config backup or you're doing a troubleshooting uh, information backup, uh, you decide which devices are backed up. You, divide, you decide which troubleshooting commands, which show commands are being used. Uh, you decide how often that backup is being done. You decide how long you're keeping historical backups for, so a number of days or weeks or months. Uh, as well as a number of revisions, uh, and it's, it's completely up to you. You can end of life them whenever you want, but you, uh, you have, there's no uh, set threshold that says, hey, after 30 days, these are going to be gone. Um, you can really 
you know, based on what your requirements are uh, for retention, you can you can set those time periods. So uh, again, I'm going to jump over into the system. I'm going to go to the device automation area, which is where a lot of the NCCM functions really happen. And I can see I'm in the backup of these devices right now. Uh, I can see a, a, a single backup. Um, that I'm reading right now. I can see the timestamps when they've done, been done. I can see this one's been done most recently today on the 20th, uh, and it actually hasn't changed in, a, in quite a while uh, from back in December. So I, I have one single line that's this backup because that, that configuration hasn't changed. Anything prior to that, I know there's been some sort of change. And if I was to pick an older one, I could do a simple config diff by right-clicking and reviewing the information, I can see, for example, here's my blue line. That means that something is new in my more recent uh, backup that wasn't there in the earlier backup that I picked. It's very easy to see. Um, I could, if it was the reverse of that, where it was there and when was no longer there in the newest backup, it would be color coded red. Uh, I can also look at these as a unified diff, which is good for export. Some other systems like to import them as unified diffs. Uh, I can create reports on these things, so I, you know, maybe a daily report, show me all configuration changes that were made yesterday, um, or uh, only those configuration changes that were made on these particular devices or kinds of devices, whatever you wish. You can also see the, uh, the the show commands, as I said earlier, so I can have the same kind of view there. I see when they were done. I can see I can store them for a certain period of time. Um, and these might be different for different devices. A firewall would have a different command, a show uh, command you might be interested in than a switch would. Uh, and you can set all of that information when you go in and tell the system which uh, show commands you should be pulling. John, um, I have a, a really good question from, from one of our attendees. We obviously have a, uh, at least one attendee who has excellent eyesight because uh, the question is, could you tell us what that red agent state 205 down means? <laughs> it, it can, Told you sure. it's a good one. My, uh, <laughs> interesting. Yeah, so we... Um, our uh, product is uh, multi-tiered, uh, meaning that there's a couple of sub-components of the product. One of the components is what we call our agents, uh, and our agents are just our software running on a platform that is actually doing a lot of the work. It's the thing that discovers devices, it connects to devices for backups. Um, if you're looking at fault and performance, it's the thing that pings devices, pulls SNMP stats, collects traps, syslogs, things like that. In our little demo system here, we've got multiple agents um, because we just, you know, this is a sandbox system that we're playing around. And in this case, two of the agents that were set up at some point are not created. One of them, or not connected, I'm sorry. One of them is a standby agent, so must, somebody must have been playing around with HA and somebody is disconnected what we call the primary agent for some reason. So just it just lets you know that in, in a scenario where you have lots of agents, if there are a few agents that are, are not connected for some reason, uh, uh, it gives you that little indication. Okay, I, I guess that cleared it That was a great question from the standpoint <laughs> of an architecture <laughs> um, and what it means. Okay, thank you. So, um, yep, yeah, no problem. Um, so I think that's basically uh, the highlights of the uh, of the uh, backup and, and troubleshooting. Issue number four uh, really gets to a lot of the heart of what we do with compliance. It's it's uh, and what we call policy checking. So the question is, do all of my devices meet my corporate compliance policies? Um, this could be something that really keeps you up at night, especially if the auditors are knocking on your door, whether those are internal auditors or external uh, auditors that are doing things like uh, payment card industry checks, PCI checks, or HIPAA, SOX, whatever, um, whatever regulations your uh, operations may be under, uh, you uh, probably at some point have been through an audit, um, including the IT assets are always some part of that. Most customers that we deal with have either their own internal compliance policies uh, and or some you know external compliance policy like a regulation again like a HIPAA SOX or ITIL or, or something um, and uh, and 
those policies, uh, it's, it's very difficult, in fact, it's really impossible to keep up to date with those policies or ensure that your devices are, are, uh, meet the compliance policies uh, unless you have a tool to help you do that. Again, this is one of those things that just can't be done manually, much like network discovery. Uh, device discovery. Back in the old days, people you know, walked into closets and poked around and wrote things down and turned it into a spreadsheet. But those, the, those days are really for large-scale networks. They're just long, long gone. You have to have a tool to help you out. Uh, StableNet has an entire part of our product that is uh, around uh, policy checking. So the idea is that you can create an electronic policy. It can be, you know, of course, based on the, the, the written down policy that you have uh, in your uh, organization. And then you can apply those policy rules to your configurations of devices. And you can see where you're compliant and where you're not compliant. Um, the, uh, the product actually ships with a couple of these uh, out of the box to help get you started, but most commonly these are things that are sort of organizationally dependent. So, you know, organization A has their policies and organization B has similar but slightly different policies. Um, you can use StableNet to design those policies, and then, of course, you can run policy checks. Uh, within uh, our solution, and I'm going to jump back in, we use a concept called snippets. So snippets to us are really pieces of code. So, uh, for example, you might have a snippet that uh, looks to see whether you've got enable passwords, or you might have a snippet to look to see uh, what the exec timeout is on your VTY lines. I mean, there's all kinds of policies. These I'm actually showing are based on the NSA Cisco guidelines. So these are ones that we use, again, as sort of default policies or templates uh, uh, in a product, but any of these can be um, sized to and finessed to your, uh, um, your needs, and then, of course, you can create your own. But those snippets are pieces of code, single lines, multiple lines, including regular expressions, that uh, we then look for in the configuration of a device. And a match could be good or could be bad. If you're looking for something that shouldn't be there, then a positive match is a violation. If you're looking for things that, that should be there, then a negative match is a violation. Um, you can get very granular with how we do our policy checks. Uh, of course, each individual snippet can have a device filter, so you're only applying that snippet to a device that matches some filter, and that filter can be, you know, a very high level, like, hey, just run this on everything that's Cisco or Cisco IOS or it could get more detailed in terms of models, types, module names. Uh, you can use regular expressions here as well. So um, if you've got tens or multiple thousands of devices, you're probably not going to apply the same policy to every device. Maybe there's one or two snippets or policies that do apply to everything, but the others are kind of tailored towards what the device is, where the device is, what the device does, that kind of thing. Um, and you can, so you can create those snippets and then you can apply them to uh, against the correct devices. Uh, you've got a lot of options here in terms of uh, what we call content continuity, which is related to things like um, what if there's a space in between uh, in the snippet? What if there's uh, a carriage return? What if they're uh, in reverse order in the actual configuration? How do I handle that? Is that a violation? Does it need to be really strict uh, in, in terms of how I do that, or can I be a little bit more loose? As long as the lines exist, I'm okay. Um, you can also make sure that those, um, sometimes it's important to have those configs or those snippets in a particular section of the code. So is it a global command? Is it something that's underneath a, uh, uh, an interface description or something like that? Where does it have to sit? Maybe you don't care where it is, or maybe you care very specifically about where that uh, snippet is. So between all of the combinations of things that you can do here, including using regular expressions for both the snippet and for the filter, um, you can create. And then by combining multiple snippets into a single policy, as you can see um, here, if I look at a single policy, for example, router, uh, network uh, service and security, that policy is actually made up of multiple snippets underneath it. So it's not a one-to-one -one thing. You can create multiple snippets. You can combine them into a policy. You can reuse snippets for multiple policies however you want. Um, and then you can run that policy check against the device. 
usually you get, or almost always, you're going, you, you're going to get a result emailed to you or, or in some sort of report, but you can also very quickly see the result of a, a policy by just double-clicking on the config of any device. Um, this will give you a nice graphical one, uh, way of, of reviewing this. You'll see when it's done here. Um, and you're going to see right, you know, and again in a color-coded fashion, what's compliant, what's been checked, what's compliant, what's not compliant, what the severity is of something that's non-compliant, etc. Um, so, uh, although of course you're going to get external alarms and reports when things don't uh, meet a compliance policy, it's also sometimes very easy to, to just log right in and look and see there it is. It's green. That's red. I can drill down into that. Uh, I can specifically see, okay, you know, uh, I uh, uh, am looking for a message of the day banner. You know, it should be present. So I see that that um, actual line content is there. That's what I, it matches to what I was expecting in terms of a regular expression and therefore it's compliant. Uh, other pieces are not compliant and they could be very severe violations or they may just be informational violations for different things. Um, it's real easy to see, it's real easy to check, um, and most importantly, it's real easy to provide a report to those compliance officers uh, or, uh, or policy officers or, or uh, outside vendors that come in and say, hey, can you prove to me that all of your devices are within your corporate compliance policy? Yes, I can. Here's the checks that I've run. Here's how often I run them, and I have green compliant across the board on every single device. Um, done. It turns a, a potentially very long, painful process into hopefully a very short uh, and easy process. So uh, back to uh, our issues that potentially keep NCCM engineers up at night. Number five uh, and uh, the last of our list today, although this doesn't mean it's everything we do, it's just sort of the last of the five we chose for the presentation, is what am I doing about lifecycle management? Um, this again in large scale networks is very important. Uh, we had a call earlier today and we were talking to some people about how important it is to make sure that you're not paying maintenance or support for things that are out of support. Seems obvious, but um, that is the case if you've, you know, many times the life cycle of a physical asset within a company can be or can exceed the support life cycle of the hardware vendor uh, that you're using. Um, they are constantly, you know, they are on, they want to, uh, they want to make money too, so they end of life, end of sales, end of support, old systems or modules or software code uh, that you might be running. And uh, it's important typically to keep up to date with those things, especially from a support contract. Um, you want to know what devices do I have, what modules do I have that are end of life or end of support within some time frame. Uh, we actually build this as a service within StableNet. So unlike everything I've shown so far, which has really been based around you buy the product and you own it and you can do what you want with it, this part of the product, uh, which is actually encompassed in a larger module we call VLM, Vulnerability and Lifecycle Management, um, that's actually run as a service. So these are kept up to date by us. Um, it is a yearly service fee. Um, the updates are sent uh, to the running system every time there's a, an update of StableNet. There's uh, the new vulnerabilities and the new uh, uh, lifecycle uh, reports are added to the system. And then you can very quickly just run a, a check. And again, this is typically something that's done, you know, vulnerabilities might be done every day or even more multiple times a day. Uh, life cycle reports are probably more often done monthly or quarterly because you kind of get a handle on where you are initially and then you just need to check back at it periodically. Um, but there, it's a very simple process. Again, it's, it's kept up to date by us uh, in the, in the uh, software. If I take a look at how that's done, we have um, both the vulnerability manager where the bulletins are kept on the vulnerability side. And if, once this comes back up, we'll show how this looks. Uh, I think we've got this system preloaded with the Cisco vulnerabilities, uh, of which there are a lot. So there you go. Uh, but there's others in there. You can see there's an F5 vulnerability. But um, for example, if I wanted to look at a, uh, uh, a Cisco uh, vulnerability in an ASA firewall, you'll see I actually get the CVE ID. I could see the URL where this was posted uh, and the advisory ID that this is uh, up against the full description and workaround and severity of that uh, bulletin. 
I can uh, see what the score settings are, if there are any, uh, the CVSS, the sort of industry's uh, uh, score for that vulnerability. These vulnerabilities are checked by using snippets in the same methodology of the snippets that I was just showing on regular policy checks. So essentially these are continuously updated policy checks for vulnerabilities and for life cycle. Um, I could see what the affected devices are. In this case, it only it applies to ASAs, and it only applies to specific versions of code. Uh, there's the affected version. There's the fixed version. Um, similarly, uh, on uh, the uh, lifecycle uh, part, I've got my end-of-life manager, which includes device end-of-life reports, module end-of-life uh, reports, and software end-of-life. So I can see... Again, here's Cisco. I can take a look and see exactly what it's got. When's end of sales? When's end of service? When is end of life? What's the notice that included this information? And that includes for modules. It's not just full you know, devices. It's, it's individual modules. It can be software. Um, so I could see modules. I could see individual pieces of software. You know, when was Cat OS 7.0, you know, end of life to 2012, finally, uh, for something so old was, was end of life and end of support. So if that still exists out there, that's probably something you would want to know about and update that to a, uh, a version that has, been, has not been end of life. Uh, both of these, interestingly, you can also add your own. So you can add your own vendor bulletin if you wish outside of our service. You can do the same thing. Uh, back here on the vulnerability. So if you've got or if you're paying attention to vulnerabilities or you see a new vulnerability come out, um, you can add your own vulnerability to this and then run a, a check uh, immediately. So this is a service that we provide, but you do have the option of going in and actually adding your own information to that um, uh, uh, if you choose to, to run the product that way. So we try to do a lot for you, but we also always make, uh, and the whole solution always makes, uh, you know, your capabilities uh, at the forefront. So whether it's writing your own policy checks, running your own vulnerabilities, doing your own configuration pushes, um, whatever it may be, you can always go into the product and, and adjust how it works. So um, that actually takes us to the end. I try to, to keep these webinars moving along. We uh, usually like to keep them to about 45 minutes or so. So there's some time uh, at the end here for question and answer. Um, I would like to note that there's a tremendous amount of resources that are available to you on our website, on our LinkedIn page, user group, on our uh, uh, YouTube. Uh, uh, InfoSim TV videos that we publish. So if you do have questions, obviously our whole sales and engineering team is available to answer them, but there are tremendous resources on the web uh, if you so choose to find them, white papers, solution briefs, industry reports, case studies, etc. So with that, Dietmar, I will turn yeah. it back over to you. Thank you very much, John. Um, well, in, in terms of questions, uh, while uh, you were Leaning back and relaxing with your presentation, uh, I had uh, two, two more staff members join uh, our chat, so we were answering those questions that were coming in. Most of them um, were from a well, technical uh, issue, so we were able to answer those uh, directly. Um, what we have, and I might add, we, we usually have that, we have a, a number of questions evolving more or less around the same topic, which is, uh, you know, what do we do different? What is what is what's the difference uh, between our product and uh, well the products that are out there in the market? Um, you know how, how do we how do we uh, attack that and how do we uh, differentiate us with uh, with uh, functionality or other things from from our competitors? So if you could well we have another couple of minutes so if you could elaborate on that a little bit that would be great. Yeah, no problem. Um, I tend to look at this from a couple of viewpoints. Um, when you're speaking specifically about the NCCM capabilities of StableNet, um, we really run up against a few different kinds of competitors. So there are, are the sort of big, well-known players that are out there, and it's, it's no secret who they are, the IBMs, the CAs, the HPs of the world. Those tend to be the people that we are up against the most. Um, I think our big advantage against those players, or one of our big advantages, is that unified uh, product 
uh, capability that we have. They, you know, the NCCM module within CA or HP is really not something they developed. It's somebody that they bought. They bolted it into their larger scale, um, you know, integrated solution. And uh, things like, you know, having the inventory information available to the configuration management system isn't always something that's done or done well or done at all. Um, because they tend to be kept in two different databases, they're different modules, they were written very differently. And so that coordination of information amongst the entire product, and which flows through to the you know, things that we didn't talk about today, performance management, fault management, things like that, um, really gives us a big advantage. We also have an advantage in scale. Uh, against almost everybody out there, um, you know there are only a few. If you're really large, there's only a few people that you can talk to. Um, and again, against those competitors that can handle that scale, we usually have a pretty good cost advantage. So, um, no reason to not bring up the fact that um, you know we we are very very cost competitive. Um, the other players in the market uh, typically come from element management systems, so individual managers from vendors. Cisco has their own, HP has their own, um, Juniper has their own, you know, those, those types of systems. And while they typically do a pretty good job, if not a very good job, of handling their own devices, they usually don't handle anybody else's devices. So unless you are a completely 100 percent you know, name your vendor network, uh, which we don't see very often anymore, those element manager systems don't really work as a single platform. Now you might have to have two or three or four element manager systems, and then you end up with what we call the zoo of, of management uh, systems, which um, we can avoid by being a multi-vendor solution. Uh, and then lastly, there are the point solutions, the things that only do uh, configuration management. They don't have the ability to do uh, fault and performance management at all. They don't do their own discovery, for example. They rely on some other product to populate them with information. Um, and again, so you need a discovery product, or you need a CMDB that's up to date. And that CMDB needs to be kept up to date by some discovery product. And so you end up making connection after connection after connection because some systems just can't do everything they need to do. Um, so uh, being able to handle multiple components in one product uh, at a very, very high scale across multiple vendor platforms at a really good price, I think, is a, all of that together makes us a, a, a real winner in the marketplace. Right. Well. Thank you very much, John. Um, again, thank you very much for uh, the presentation uh, altogether. Um, we have a couple of more questions. Uh, those are more detailed questions uh, in in terms of uh, pricing and you know how we how we put together the system. If you have to, uh, if you can buy it modular, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, again, since this is uh, supposed to be a more technical webinar, we don't want to go into into all details in this session right now. So um, we don't want to you know do more Q and A than. Uh, uh, we think is necessary in here, but uh, don't be afraid. All of your questions are going to be answered. Uh, we have all of those questions on record, and those questions that we were not able to answer directly um, through a personal chat message or here in, in the Q&A, uh, we're going to attend to later, so uh, it's all on record, and uh, you're going to be uh, in contact with us, uh, well, if not today, then probably tomorrow or early next week. Again, everybody, thank you for joining our session today. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this webinar is being uh, recorded, and a uh, recording is going to be made available to all of you tomorrow via email. Um, and again, no, I'm repeating myself, but I, you know, just uh, stress this one more time. If you have any other question, feel free to contact uh, John, myself, or any other member of the sales staff with InfoSim. So thanks again for joining us today, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. Thank you.